Hi, everyone. Hey, Welcome live. to our classroom with Kenny Broad and Jill Heiner. I'm Megan Modafferi, Community Manager here at National Geographic Education. We are so excited about the global connections we have here today. I'm broadcasting from Nat Geo in Washington, D.C. Our host, Joe Gabowski, is in Ontario. Our explorers, Kenny and Jill, are in the field in the Bahamas where they are exploring and mapping blue holes or underwater caves. And we have classrooms watching from live from all over the world. Tweet using the hashtag Let's Explore to let us know where you're watching from. You can also share questions with Kenny and Jill using that same hashtag, which is again, let's explore. No apostrophe, that's just hashtag L-E-T-S-E-X-P-L-O-R-E. -E -E. Now before we get started, I just wanna remind our teachers watching to check out natgeoed.org for free lesson plans, principal maps, resources, and cool professional development opportunities. And as always, I wanna thank our host, Joe Grabowski, and our wonderful explorers for being with us today. All right, Joe, we're ready for another Great Explorer Classroom Hangout. All right, thanks so much for the intro, Megan. Uh, this is a pretty special Hangout today. It's our first one with the BGAN unit, which is a really cool piece of technology that allows us to connect pretty much anywhere on the planet uh, without an internet signal. Um, this is our second Hangout with Jill and Kenny. Um, the first one was last month where they introduced themselves and shared a little bit about their project. So for those who don't know who are tuning in, Jill's passion and curiosity led her to explore some of the most remote and dangerous places on our planet, from dangerous technical dives in underwater caves to Antarctic icebergs. And Kenny Broad, he's an anthropologist. He studies the relationship between humans and the environment. So his extreme filmmaking and expeditions have taken him to every continent, from jungles to the deepest caves on our planet. Um, today they're joining us from Abaco in the Bahamas, part of a Nat Geo uh, expedition to explore, document, and create 3D virtual reality maps uh, of possibly the most extensive underwater cave system uh, on an island in the world. So, uh, Kenny and Jill, thanks so much for joining us from the site today. Looking good. Hey, it's good to be with you all. Nice to uh, nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, so we're in the field. So I think. We'd like to show you some pictures about actually what's right beneath where we're standing and explain it a little bit. Bill's going to explain how you explore in this kind of challenging place. And then we're going to introduce you to some of the different explorers, but even better, some of the kids who are out here with us who are going through all sorts of different exploration of their own. So I think we're going to switch over to a presentation now. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, why don't you jump Excuse in front me. of the computer and I'll uh, stand here until we get a screen share happening. And uh, Kenny's going to roll with a little bit of a, a picture and video show to give you a feel for the environment right beneath our feet. All right. So while we wait for that to load, Jill, what's the temperature like today? We've got snow on the ground up here in Guelph. Well, yeah, you guys have snow on the ground. We're like sweating. It's humid. It's hot. It's in the 80s. We're expecting a cold front to come through tonight, so it might chill us down a little bit, but... Uh, Pass the sunscreen. <laughs> sunscreen, <laughs> sand flies, mosquitoes, you know, that kind of summer it's stuff that working. you guys experience. All right. Gotcha. How are we doing on the screen share? Yeah, it's not coming up. Not okay. Wait a minute. I can keep talking. Yeah, keep so talking. We have um, some school kids here, yeah. and uh, they're exploring with us. They're going through a series of activities we're showing them some cave diving safety tips and letting them go through an artificial cave, which is actually behind me here. And we are showing them some animals that Brian Cake Cook caught this morning in the cave, loaded them into little jars, and we're going to uh, show those to you in, uh, in a few minutes as well. And he's brought them up just for a couple of hours. So they're on a little holiday from the cave. And then after our presentation today, they'll be returned to the water so that they can uh, be back in their home. We also have some 3D augmented reality stuff happening here today. So kids can put on these glasses and actually look into the back of the van that we're using like a theater space. And inside that van, they can see augmented reality, three-dimensional like cave formations and a line map of our cave and some cool things that we've scanned in other caves, like the, a, a jaw from a human being. We've actually scanned underwater and created these 3D augmented reality models. So you don't have ever played Pokemon? It's kind of like Pokemon on steroids. You see the real environment, the 3D 
things yeah. projected in the environment. We're going to switch off of you to try to get the camera back okay. on this. Otherwise, yeah. just... we're going to try and switch over to the screen uh, screen share now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll come back and share more with you in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, All I'm right. Going to switch off. Looking. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. There's Ian right, and Kenny. All right. Just a second. Yeah. The screen sharing is a little, uh, a little funky. Can you see us while we're doing this? I can. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, so to keep well, while Keen's working out the technical part, so we've got different stations set up as, as Jill started to describe. So some simulated cave diving, but luckily there's more air up here than down there. We've got a station where kids are learning about bush medicine because many of the plants around here over time that's what people use for medicine for food for soap all sorts of different things and the blue holes that we're diving in are the critical sources of water back then and so people were very aware of where their water came from but now we magically turn on our tap and water comes out but in fact it's the same water systems but it's out of sight out of mind so part of our project is, is working and making that link between what's beneath our feet and what comes out of our tap so we can keep our, our drinking water safe for the next generations. We've got another station out in the forest where people are taking cores of the pine trees so they can count uh, the tree rings and learn how to estimate how long it took for that tree to grow, how tall it is, just sort of forestry related things. Remember, these trees are getting their water from right down into the limestone. We've got another station and you can go to, uh, there's a link at National Geographic Voices to the expedition where every day we're doing video and written blog posts and you can see all this, where the kids are actually using trackers and where we have a device underwater water, and it's actually sending up a signal and the kids then track what's going on beneath their feet. And that way they can, you can really get a sense of the cave passageways right beneath us. So there's all sorts of different stations and there's a, a of augmented reality where they can actually see the cave and point to parts where parts of the cave come up. So it looks like we're not going to screen share. So uh, maybe we can just keep on uh, talking. We'll bring some yeah, stuff, we'll over, bringing stuff and, over. And uh, why don't you go hits, into? Yeah. How about this? Should I go in front of that camera? Is that better? Uh, we'll I think bring this people? is fine. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're we're online here. So um, yeah, why don't we uh, why don't we grab a couple of animals in the vials and bring okay. them over and show you. Uh, and I can show you a little bit about that. Should I give, we can do sort of as if we were doing, but let, let me explain exactly how the caves form. Sure. Just real quickly. Imagine when it rains, the water goes through the atmosphere. It picks up a little bit of carbon dioxide and gets slightly acidic and it hits the ground and it mixes with the soils and it becomes very acidic. And then it eats into the limestone. And that's how the fresh water gets down there. But since we're on an island, there's also salt water that's under our feet in the limestone. It's as if we're all standing on a sponge. But the fresh water is lighter and the salt water is heavier. And where those two meet is called a halocline. And all sorts of animals move between the salt and the fresh. But remember, they're living in 100% darkness. And many of them don't have eyes. And I'm just going to hold them up here. He's and, swimming around like crazy, and you keep talking, Kenny. And uh, Jill, this is, if you can see that, that it's hard to tell if it's a guy or a girl, but it's a remipede, we know that, which is actually a new class of crustaceans that was found in the Bahamas, and it's got dozens of legs swimming around there, and it's actually the top predator, and you can see how tiny it is, but it's the top predator in the cave. And remember, it doesn't have eyes. It only senses from either vibrations or some kind of chemical signal in the water. But it actually has poisonous fangs. Yeah, so he, he's called a remipede, which means like with paddles, because his little arms are like paddles. And he's Godzilla gnomus, so like the Godzilla gnome. <laughs> and uh, he's got little venomous pincers, so he can actually like lock onto something, inject venom, and kind of dissolve the thing and eat it over time. So this guy's only about an inch long, but um, if he was the size of a cat, he'd be the deadliest thing on the planet. So he's no no risk to us, but certainly he can find something inside the cave and uh, kill it and eat it. So And he's a beautiful, beautiful swimmer. So we're just borrowing him for a couple of hours here, and then we're going to take him back in the water and set him free. 
And we think that animals like the remipede, we think they've been around for over 200 million years with very little change because the caves that have formed here, which a big question, maybe one of you will solve it one day, is that if we go back to the last ice age about 20,000 years ago, the caves were about, oh, 400 feet lower than they are now. So what we're swimming in, were, these were once dry caves. So, but the water came up. So there must be other deeper caves or somewhere where these animals have been able to survive over time. So that's one of the scientific mysteries that some of the cave biologists are, are also interested in studying. So we sort of think of these guys like little swimming dinosaurs because they've actually been around in their current form like longer than the extinction of the dinosaurs. So that's a really long time. And maybe they can teach us something interesting about survival and evolution and living in these environments where there's absolutely no light and very, very little food. Yeah, the, some of the blue holes we dive in actually have what's to us a poisonous hydrogen sulfide layer, that rotten egg smell that uh, you, you sometimes smell it at a spring or some people call it sewer gas. And we can actually smell it underwater because it goes through our skin. But certain types of bacteria, they thrive in it. And that's kind of poisonous primordial soup is what we think that the earth actually, the ancient oceans, that life came out of over, well, four and a half billion, that's with a B, years ago. So lots of people who are interested, not just in early forms of life, but what life may be able to exist in outer space, you know, in Europa or under the ice where there's extreme conditions, they actually come to the Bahamas to study some of these blue holes. Very cool. So what should we look at next? Um, How about some cave diving gear since yeah, yeah. how do you get in those places? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Jill's a cave diving instructor and one of the greatest explorers. So I'm turning that to her. <laughs> Okay, so cave diving, um, obviously we have to do absolutely everything in an environment where um, we can't just easily surface like you do in normal scuba diving. So normally if you have a problem underwater, you can just swim up. But we're going down inside a cave, so laterally, almost like swimming through branches of a tree underwater. And we might be even as far as like a mile or two underneath the water and underneath an overhead environment. So everything that happens, we have to be able to solve it underwater. That means that we take a lot of equipment. And I've had as much as 600 pounds of equipment on me at any given time in order to both serve as my life support equipment, but also cameras, video cameras, still cameras that are specially prepared for the underwater environment. So some of the things that we use are things that might look familiar to anybody out there that's a scuba diver, like a, a scuba tank that we can breathe on and we can breathe compressed gas. But we also have another really cool piece of equipment called a rebreather, where we can, instead of making bubbles every time we exhale, we can actually recirculate that exhaled gas. We can clean the carbon dioxide out of that gas, inject a little bit more oxygen back into it to make up what we've metabolized, and then breathe it all over again. And that's exactly what an astronaut does when they do a spacewalk, like outside the International Space Station. Very same equipment that we're using underwater. And that allows us to go farther and deeper and longer into the planet, into what I call swimming through the veins of Mother Earth. So I think we're going to switch over to the other camera here, and we can show you some kids who are practicing some cave diving techniques um, over in the field here. Hang on. Hey, Jill, here's a rebreather. Okay. <laughs> He's got a rebreather here that you can see. And uh, are we uh, on that? Yeah, okay. And which, which mic am I speaking into here? Right here? Okay. So Kenny's got a rebreather that he's holding up. It's a pretty wild piece of equipment. So that's like a gas supply in the black tank. He's got a, um, a breathing loop. And then that big canister is filled with a chemical that's going to remove the carbon dioxide from each exhaled breath. And if we look over Kenny's shoulder, there's actually some people in the field there that are practicing cave diving techniques. So um, you might be able to see in the distance a guideline. And on that guideline, there's going to be some kids coming along. And they're keeping contact with this guideline as if they were blind as if they had run out of visibility and needed to escape from the cave. Now, there's 
crawling through our fake cave, this uh, wooden box over here. And in a minute, they're going to emerge from that wooden box cave, <laughs> holding on to the guideline. Okay, here comes somebody. Here comes somebody now. I see a hand. They've got to squeeze through a little restriction just to simulate the kinds of restrictions that we uh, that we have to swim through. And if they hold on to the guideline, they'll get to these little triangular markers that mark the way out of the cave. Oh, can you see the hand? Oh, here comes a face. And we blindfolded them to uh, simulate no visibility. And we've given them three minutes of air to compete the, complete this obstacle course. <laughs> so it looks like our student from Long Bay is successfully getting out of the cave. <laughs> so pretty cool, eh? All right, another thing that we're doing here is some bush medicine um, with the kids, showing them the plants and things that, uh, that live around here and the local medicines that are made. So Terrence from the Department of Forestry here in Abaco is going to show us a little bit of the, uh, the plants and the teas that they make for medicine. So off to you, Terrence. Okay. Oh, you can just show okay, some of well, the different uses of different plants. Fallberry. Fallberry are soap. Bush, okay. Back in the day, they used to use this to actually. I can rest these right down. Yeah, yeah. They used to rest. Uh, use these to actually bathe. If you take one and peel it, I mean, it's good for it. it brings hair too. So you probably want to. You're almost there. Oh yeah. Don't let take go, it, don't let it. Use it too. <laughs> <laughs> and rub it on the skin. It's real smooth and it has oh, a good yeah. scent. You know. Yeah. Oh, it has a good. A good oh, scent. Oh yeah, it smells it. good. All right. So, what we have here is five fingers. Oh, so five fingers. And this is good for the five senses. So we have five fingers with us here. And you throw it the table. That's all right. This is also called um, chicken toe. So I'm gonna make Kenny drink it uh, because it's like medicine, and I'm not so sure. So I don't know if it'll help, my it. but I think we call it five finger uh, oh, chicken toe. But oh, that chicken toe. Yeah, five finger chicken toe. Same oh, thing. five finger chicken toe. It's five fingers representing the five right. five, five senses, senses right? right? Smell and the, and the five right. leaves. Right. And the five leaves. Go figure. So let's see if it's going to be successful in helping Kenny grow some hair. Hey, here's the exploration. <laughs> no matter what your hair looks like. Wonderful. Ooh, it, it must be good for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know I don't taste. Yeah, it actually has a good aftertaste. <laughs> wow. It's, some people put a little honey in it or sugar. Yeah, just to sweeten it up. Yeah. All right. So this is good. And what? What else we got? We have uh, Madeira back on mahogany. I had a toothache that was bothering me for some time ago, right? I was trying to get it knocked out, but I couldn't get it out. So what I could do is peel this back a little bit, and I could take a piece of the bar, put it inside there, clamp on it, and he suggests it open until I can get to the dentist, right? Yeah, in some remote areas, it's not as if, oh, my mouth hurts, I can go right to the dentist. Right, you actually right. have, have to figure time. out how to take care of yourself. So everything around this blue hole, all of these plants provide all of the medicine and and nutrition, really, that people need around here. You just right. have to know what it is. That's what you're looking for. This here is rat tail. Go figure. Rat tail. <laughs> I know, right? And this is used to, as a dewormer. It gets rid of worms. So those who, those of us who like candy and sweets, sometimes worms come along with that. Right. Drink some tea from this. Hey, a dewormer, okay? Wait, are you telling me that if I eat candy and sweets, I'm going to get worms? Well, I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but if, but if you won't notice because your teeth will fall out and you'll need the other plant. <laughs> but if you do this, remember, rat tail, okay? So it's good for... It's got, tail. It has a beautiful flower. It's right. not on here now, right? right? But yeah, a yeah, little purple flower. flower. Yeah. Right. That's good. Okay, so... Cool. Shots at, eh? There's also poisonous plants here, too. Like, sometimes we get contact with something poison called poison right. wood. And... Um, and honestly, it's not that much fun because it burns and it makes your arm kind of look like cheese pizza if you get it on you. But the cool thing is, poison wood usually grows. I'm not going to touch it. No. You into it. <laughs> right you beside a plant or tree that's like the antidote. So right beside it grows the cure. Oh, yeah, I won't well, touch it. <laughs> and we have some more cave diving equipment too. I'm going to yeah. go round up some of our students. Yeah, you bet. All right. Oh yeah, so this is the antidote or the cure this. for this, and it grows right beside it. So it's like a companion plant, and that's that's pretty amazing. Cool. Hey, Corey, come on over here with your uh, virtual reality uh, or augmented reality headset. 
So Corey Jaskowski is the innovation fellow from National Geographic, and uh, he has an augmented reality headset that I'm going to let him explain to you. All right. Hi, I'm Corey. Um, what we got here is an augmented reality headset, and it's really cool. It's, it's a little bit different than virtual reality, where when you wear the goggles, you can only see the virtual world. You can actually look through these like sunglasses. You can probably see that they're clear. You can look through them like sunglasses, but what we can do is we can put 3D models inside of them. I'll put them on here. So I look a little crazy, but um, what's really neat is I can see a bunch of different models in front of me. What I can actually see is we have a map of the cave, and then we have a big crystal that we scanned in the cave in front of me. And I can actually look around it and walk around it. And we were showing some of the students before. We had these in the back of the van where it was dark, and you could look around with the goggles. And what I'm seeing here, I think I can show you. So imagine Corey's been sitting there at the back of the van going, hey, kids, come here. Let me show you something <laughs> in my van. Don't do that in any other case except here. Right, right. <laughs> so I don't know if I can get that in the webcam well. Um, but that crystal uh, is actually what I'm looking at. So that's projected in 3D in front of me, right about where the phone is. I see it about you know three or four feet tall, though, and can actually um, you know look around it. I can spin it around in 3D space. And one of the reasons we do this is so we can share it with people. Um, you know, some of the things that we find in caves, like fossils, uh, it's really important to never take these out of caves um, because we want to preserve it for future generations and save it for scientific study. So by doing these 3D scans that we can model, we can save it so, uh, so everybody can see it in the future and leave it exactly where it is and not disturb the cave. So you're going to be able to go to virtual museums, or the virtual museums will come to you. You'll have one of these headsets, and maybe all your friends will have them. And you can all interact with the same object and go, hey, look at that pot. Let's spin it around. You see that break in there? And everybody can examine it. And then you can take that same data that Corey gets from his scans and print three-dimensional replicas so that somebody could even hold something that looks exactly like the object that we left underwater undisturbed. So it's really powerful. We can bring the museum and even the artifacts to you without destroying anything. Cool stuff. Awesome. Thanks, Jill. <laughs> hey, we got Thank you. some Long Bay. All right, we got some kids got from Long, Long Bay, Bay that want to say on. hello. They've been on um, our previous Google Hangouts as well. And so, uh, so we're all friends now. <laughs> so, here we go. Let's, how about introducing yourselves? Hello. Yeah. Hi, my name is Whitney Russell. Cool. What's your name? My name is Daphne DeHaiti. All right. Hi, my name is Shivante Roberts. Cool. Speak up. My name is Jane. Yeah, everybody Lee. talk loud. Come in close. Talk yep. loud. Yep. Right here. There you go. Okay, we're talking. <laughs> yeah, talk yeah. Hi, my name is Whitney Russell. Cool. Hi, my name is Shivante Roberts. <laughs> right. Hi, my name is Daphne DeHaiti. <laughs> so, Hi, my name is Brianna Arno. Hi, my name is Jada Bean. Hi, my name is Jose Roland. All right. Hi, my name is Kenny Brown. I'm in eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> so, how far is Long Bay from here? Very far. Do you have blue holes in Long Bay? No. 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 So, that's why you came all the way here. I did that in the pool. So what was the coolest <laughs> thing you saw today? Um, the, um, the, the animals. The, the animals inside that little. So we got one, the animal. Come. Yep. So the there animals? There. Yeah, yeah, there you go. You're looking in the camera there. Yeah, what, yeah. what kind of animals? Um, I think they were shrimps. Right, right. Yeah, they are cool. They look cool. And I like how they, um, how he taught, he told us that, they, like how um, the scorpions, I think. Oh, right, the oh. remipedes. Yeah, they, they, have have the, the they have those things, but there's two. And they, right. um, in order for them to eat, they stick their, um, they stick the animal with it. You do it to my head. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, they stick ah! the animal with it. And, like, whatever inside, like the meat or something, it turns into jello so that they could just slurp it up. Wow. So who did the cave tracking yeah. already? You did? Yeah. Huh? So tell them where the cave is. It, like, under... Like, it but depends. The so they were tracking the cave with this device called Cave Radio, and they had to find where we left a pinger inside the cave. So where did the pinger end up? Oh, I it, know. Was it was under the porta potty. Under the port 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 it was under the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> so they tracked it 
tracked it here like through the woods and discovered that we'd put a pinger inside the cave deep beneath the earth but underneath the porta potty <laughs> so what did you guys learn from that i don't know what is contaminated yeah. <laughs> or watch out where we our water goes yeah right? that anything we do on top of the land can soak into the ground and end up in the caves and inside the caves is our drinking water who got blindfolded and put on the cave gear? Okay, come on, Jose, you get in here and describe it. Go, Jose, go. Okay, when I went, to you can look right into them. Here. Yeah. Okay. It was it was very dark, and I didn't know where I was going. But I I learned how to follow the the line to go to the cave, and I found my way out. You survived. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Should we get what some right? questions from the kids? Uh, yeah, yeah. the kids in the field, they might have questions for you guys too. So hang out with us. That's why we call it a Google Hangout. <laughs> well, you got something to say. Sam. So Joe, do we have some <laughs> questions from some of the schools? Absolutely. So I'm going to pop into each classroom uh, one by one. I'll okay. introduce them and we'll start off with one question from each classroom. We'll yep. see how things go from there. All right. Awesome. So our first class is joining us. Mr. Cameron's grade five, six from Thunder Bay, Ontario. Uh, Mr. Cameron, you'll just have to turn the mic on for me and then go ahead. Hey, Mr. Cameron, I think I might have, I might have talked to your class before. <laughs> Maybe. Wave to him. Hi. 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 Hello, Thunder Joe. Bay, Ontario. It's a long way away. Yeah, great to hey, see you. Hey, Mr. Cameron. <laughs> Incredible once again. Awesome. So. Uh, here comes our first question from Thunder Bay. Cool. Hi, my name is Brooklyn, and my question is, Do have you ever encountered with any rare animals in the blue holes? Yeah, so those little animals that everybody here saw this morning, and the one we were trying to show you in the vial, um, those are really rare. In fact, some of them are endemic. That means that they live only in one cave that we found them, on the whole planet. And in some cases, animals can be endemic to a single room in a single cave. Now there might be more of them on planet Earth, but there's not too many cave divers that can identify animals. So we haven't found them yet. Um, so yeah, there's lots of rare animals in the caves. And I think these guys will tell you, they're pretty cool, aren't they? Yeah. Very cool. yeah. yeah. What, what was what was the craziest looking one you saw? Um, the shrimp. Red things. Yeah, shrimp. Oh, oh, red shrimp. There's a red shrimp called Barboria that lives pretty close to the entrance, and, and um, he's beautiful, isn't he? Really bright, bright red. It's like you're coloring. He's shirt, about that big. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Good question. In Bahamas, these kids are lucky. They live in the biodiversity hotspot, meaning there's more different kinds of cave life and probably more abundance of cave life than anywhere else on this planet. So, I wish I wish I was behaving. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Do we have another question? All right, let's jump to our next group. We have Mrs. Warren's grade six class joining us in Hutchinson, Kansas. And Mrs. Warren, you'll just have to pop the mic on for me. Um, hey, Mrs. Hutchinson, how's the weather in Kansas? Good. It's getting a little cold here. We are under twenty. Okay. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Jaden. Woo! Okay. How do you get out of caves if you get lost? All right, fine. How do we get out of caves if we get lost? Hey, yeah. let's grab Brian. Yeah, get over yeah, here. Brian, you got a question. Get over here, Brian. <laughs> You're going to meet the person who's explored more of this cave than anyone else. He lives here in the Bahamas. How do you get out of Brian the cave? Brian Pecos. How do you get out of the cave? <laughs> that was a question. How do you get out of the cave to get lost? So, um, we have this all this string right here is uh we, we make circuits throughout the cave anytime we explore um we lay the line out as we go in and we tie it off to different places along the way and uh we keep it very tight and uh, at the end we actually use it to measure to make maps and that's what we're doing here now is making maps uh, so but if we have any kind of problem in the cave where the visibility is lost, either because we've lost lights or we've stirred up the sediments, then we actually learn, have learned how to get on the line, put our fingers around it, and follow it out by braille. And uh, when I teach cave diving, that's one of my, uh, one of my big tests is where we, I take my students very far back in the cave and we say, okay, lights out, 
and um, we put them on the line and they follow it out by Braille. Sometimes there are other lines in the area and we have to make sure they don't actually go off on the wrong lines. So there are markers that we actually place on the lines that are tapered and you can feel those with your, with your fingers. These are the line arrows right here. So you see that they, they mark a certain direction and you weave those on the line and you can feel them tactically, you can feel them and know no matter how many lines are in the area, when you find that marker, that's definitely the one that's going back to the entrance. And that's how we find our way out. Hopefully we'll get, eventually get out of the, the bad visibility or we'll get someplace where there's some light and we'll be able to continue on out. But that's that, how we do it. And all the kids here today yeah. had to find their way through an artificial cave that we built, well, Brian built, <laughs> and Brian and Alex. <laughs> And so they followed the guideline through the cave. So did everybody survive? Yes. Are you alive? Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, we have the other thing we're doing on this project is mapping the cave. And we have, where's our, our hey, here's our, today's cave explorer who lives here in the Bahamas, Christina Zanato, who actually was born in Italy, but now lives in Grand Bahama. And she's going to explain how we figure out where we are in the cave and how we map it. So... Uh, show. What I do is obviously the line that Brian so dutifully put it down and carefully has knots on it and it has a measure. It's usually 10 feet, about three meters of distance. And what we try is to go from one fixed point to the other fixed point of the line. Uh, we use a kind of like very precise compass, which I'm having difficulty right now. I'm just looking at the compass like this in the cave. <laughs> <laughs> I need glasses. And a little bubbles to make sure that actually the slate is actually in line with the cave line and is perfectly aligned. And we take a measurement of where we're going. That's called the azimuth. And then uh, we count the knots on the line and that gives me the distance. And then once I get to the, my next station, so where the line changes uh, direction, what I do is I look at my depth and record the depth depth at which the line changes and then I start this all over again till the next time the line changes again so from one knot to the other and then once we collect all this data I give it to uh, Sebastian, Sebastian <laughs> who actually has created a very unique system to put all this data inside the computer and here comes Sebastian and actually he makes this number become a map yeah. Yeah. He's computer guy yeah, from computer France, yeah. not Quebec, but he lives in Mexico. So who knows where you're going to end up one day? Yeah, well, surprising. So it might so. seem like still a pretty primitive process, but Sebastian and people like Corey and other scientists are now making it more and more automated so that it uh, becomes more precise and easier for us to do. Now That's we have we someone from the National Museum of the Bahamas here. Who can she grab a fossil to bring to show the kids? Yeah, how about a crocodile? Get a, go catch a crocodile. <laughs> cool. In the meantime, let's go for another question. All right. We have uh, Mrs. Kaiser's group in Freehold, New Jersey. They're a grade five class. And your microphone's on. Hi. All right. Hey, Mrs. Kaiser. Hey, Freehold. Wait. Hi. So, um, hey, this way. So my question is, how did you find your passion for exploring and map mapping a back of blue holes? So how did we find our passion? You know, a lot of us have really what we would call like unconventional careers or hybrid careers where we have to do a lot of different things in order to stay underwater in the water where we do what we love. So for me, I'm actually an artist. I did a Bachelor of Fine Arts. Kenny's an anthropologist. Nancy, who you're going to meet in a second, is a paleontologist. So a lot of us have some area of special interest. Corey, technology and computer systems and mathematics. Uh, but we all love to dive too. And so we've married our passion and our academic interest in order to build careers in the underwater environment. And my sort of advice to you guys, everybody out there, is that you live in a globally connected world now and you can reach out to any of us, people all around the planet doing cool things and learn about those and create careers and, and occupations that, that we don't even have titles for yet. So you're gonna have some pretty exciting jobs ahead. She caught the crocodile. She caught the okay. crocodile. Right. She's holding it shut with an elastic. Okay, can we see it? All right, so, so it's being held together because the jawbone would come apart, but this is a, crocodile skull of a Cuban freshwater crocodile that we found here. The very first one was actually found in this same blue hole. Um, and we found them all over the Bahamas and 
And it turns out that these crocodiles were all over the Bahamas, and they're freshwater species for the most part. Uh, but we know that these crocodiles, kind of how big they were, because we have a one to seven ratio, and if we have a one foot skull, then it was about a seven foot crocodile. And if we, who has the bones? Okay, here's a bone. Jose's got some bones. Okay, who's else got a bone here? All right, so if we knew, for instance, that this bone came from that crocodile, which in fact it didn't, but if we thought that this bone came from that crocodile because they were found together, and then we found a bone like that, who wants to hold this? Why don't you hold that right there? There you go. Hold it from underneath. Yep. You don't want it to come apart. Um, and we found a different bone, then you would have assume that not only was it a bigger crocodile, that we had, maybe it was being found in a different cave. So we had crocodiles all over the Bahamas. So that's how we use comparative material, because sometimes that's all we find. So in paleontology, you're looking at maybe one single bone, but you can tell what species it is, and sometimes you can tell how big it was. And then who, why don't you hold those for me? And then some of the other species that we're finding were tortoises, really big tortoises, and you can actually look inside of it. I don't know if we can see it. Yep. Can we see it in there? We're going to so. look at it that way. Can we see in there? It has a backbone, and they're so complete that they have all of their bones in them. In fact, this was actually a female because it has a flat belly. It's called a plastron, and the top of it is unique and these species came from South America. Who wants to hold this? Can somebody here, why don't you hold this right there? Hold it very carefully because we don't have another one like it. Okay. Yeah, put your hand yeah, underneath the, the belly. Yeah. So yes, hold it tight. Okay. So that tortoise had this bone that came out of it. And again we know how big this bone was that it was a humerus and it belonged to that tortoise. But what about when we found that bone? And if you can see them together, you can tell that they were both tortoises. So we had a tortoise here and one here. And there's a big difference. I think you guys can look at it and hopefully see what a difference it was. But this was all we found of one tortoise. We didn't find anything else. But it was enough to tell us that the tortoises got really, really big compared to this one that she's holding. So they were upwards to several feet across. So those are just a few of the things that we're finding in addition to all sorts of fun stuff. Um, owl roosts and things like that that have lots of remains of their previous meals and it's telling us about the past ecosystems in the Bahamas. Cool. So Nancy's job is a paleontologist, so she studies bones. So do we have another question out there, either for Nancy or anyone else here? Absolutely. Let's jump to another classroom. We have Mr. Steele's grade eights joining us uh, in Iowa. Let me turn your microphone on. Hey, Mr. Steele's class. Nice to meet you. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so Devon is here with a question. Uh, okay. What is the deepest you've ever dived or the longest you've ever stayed on the underwater? Okay, so the question was, what's the deepest we've ever dived or the longest uh, I've been underwater? So my deepest dive is uh, about 460 feet deep. And my longest diving mission was around 22 hours, and that was with Brian, who you met a second ago. And uh, not all of that time was underwater, but um, but a lot of it was. It was a big, big mission deep inside a cave in Florida. All right, we have another question out there. All right, let's jump to Mrs. Huddy's class. They're joining us. They're a grade two classroom, and they're in Calgary in Canada. Your microphone is on. Hello. Hey, Mrs. Huddy. Hi. Can you get a little closer to the microphone? We missed that one. Okay, we might have to. A little closer, a little closer or a little louder. What is water and Is it cold? Is it warm? Is water even ice? Mrs. Huddy, can you? Okay. 
Okay, I need someone to repeat that for us because they're breaking up. So, Joe, maybe you can repeat that for us? Yeah, I only caught part of it, guys. Can you try one more time near the microphone? Um, what is the warmest and coldest water you've been in for? Okay, they're asking about the coldest and warmest water you've been in. You've been in. Okay, the coldest water I've been in is minus 1.8. And I bet you're thinking, but that's frozen. Yeah, so almost um, one-tenth of a degree colder, and it would be frozen solid. And that was in Antarctica when I was cave diving inside an iceberg. And then the warmest water that I've been in is probably oh, high, high 80s or like 30 Celsius or so. What about you, Kenny? Uh, almost exactly the same. And it was in Antarctica, and then it was in the Caribbean. So, and actually in some... Some of that warm water in the very cold water, we don't see some of the same things that grow in the warm water. There's different types of life that can live in each of the extreme environments. And we just, we have a couple more explorers who came in, and we also have Whitney. Show them what you got, Whitney. This is a stalagmite. Yeah, a stalagmite. And remember we were talking about how the caves formed only when the sea level was lower? Well, these are the things that form in these crystals, crystal caves. Show them the other side, Whitney. And we actually, that's one that's cut in half because this is what we use to study climate change. Because we can go back, these things might only grow this much distance in a thousand years. And as they're growing, we can go back and study the isotopes of carbon and oxygen and learn, well, what the temperature was like, how much rain there was, all about different climate things. So this is just one of the other things that we can learn here in the caves in the Bahamas. And remember, stalactites and stalactites. But I think we have time. Because you hang on tight. Because you hang on tight <laughs> so you don't fall off. But maybe we can turn the camera and we'll see if some of the other kids around. But also take a look at the pine forest because we have someone here who's an expert on our team. He's a biologist, Tom Morris, who's going to talk just a little bit about the area that we're doing the expedition in. Here's Tom. Let's see, I forgot my passport, but <laughs> I think. And remember, whenever you travel international, take a passport. Do I stare right into there? Am yeah. I looking at all the kids? Hey, kids. I'm Tom Morris. I'm an ecologist from Florida. And the kids and I have been looking at the pine forest around here. This is a tropical Bahamian pine forest. It's a special kind of pine tree. It's the Caribbean pine, but it's the Bahamian variety that occurs only on the Bahamian archipelago. And most of the forests are up here in the north end on the big islands. There's a small pine forest down in, in Caicos, which is part of the archipelago but it's a different country it's not the bahamas they got a little bit of a problem going on down there they brought christmas trees from the mainland from the continent and darn if they didn't have these little scale insects on them and the and these things flew off the pine, off those christmas trees and are and are killing the pine trees down there in the caicos islands but anyhow one of the things that we were looking at with the kids is the growth rings and trees have annual growth rings and here, yeah, you will hold that stuff for me. And I think you can probably see them on the camera. Yep. And the, the wide white part of the ring is the summer, spring and summer wood when the trees are growing very rapidly. And even here in the Bahamas in a tropical climate where it really don't have much of a winter, come fall, they kind of shut down and they end up making a little bitty brown ring. And so we can count these rings. It's like looking kind of at a bullseye or a dartboard. You start right in the middle, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This tree's like about 11 or 12 years old. And let's say you have a, a favorite tree in your front yard. I'm going to drill it for you. And you'd like to know how old it is. You could go out with a chainsaw, I'll right? Hold the head still. <laughs> You could go out with a chainsaw. Okay, Kenny, I got it. <laughs> oh, I see what's going on. <laughs> you could go out and cut that tree down, but then your favorite tree would be gone. But what we have is a little tool called an increment bore. It's a coring tool. And we basically shove that into the tree. It has an auger end to it. And you drill it into the tree and then pull it back out. And you can extract the little thin core. I don't have a piece of it right now, unfortunately. Yeah, there's the end of it. My tool's broken. The tip is back in one of those pine trees back there. Um, but anyhow, we can tell how old they are. And the oldest individual things in the world are bristlecone pines. They grow in high, 
horrible climate of some of the White Mountains and other mountains in California and Nevada, and they know how they, you wouldn't want to cut those trees down. You don't cut the oldest things in the world down. So we take an increment bore. They're about this long, and they core into the darn things, and they count the growth rings. The growth is such a harsh environment that the growth rings are so close together that they have to use magnifying glasses to count them. So it takes real experts to do that. Cool. But those are the 5,000 years old. Cool. Yeah. So I think we've got another school out there that hasn't asked a question yet. Have you got one, Joe? That's right. We have two more classes to visit. Uh, we'll visit Mishagasi's group, grade six in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Let me make sure the mic is on. There we go. Hi. Hey, kids. <laughs> Hi, my name is. Hi. Uh, when you go in a blue hole, have you ever found an unknown species or an animal that has never been documented before? Yes, we have. In fact, one of our team members here, Brian, who you met a little bit earlier, has brought a whole bunch of critters out, and he even got some of them partly named after him. Is Brian still here? He's down there, but oh, okay. uh, Tom, the Tom has some oh, named yeah, Tom after him. Oh, yeah, has one yeah. named after him, too, yeah. Yeah, I've got a little Hi, Nancy has one name. Yeah, we got a bunch of people here that have. You know, if you go. What's to yours called? What's yours called? Procambarus morrisi. There you go. So, so it's a shrimp, right? <laughs> so this is fame. The family name lives on on a little crayfish. That only about maybe it's in a journal from the North Carolina Museum, and maybe twelve people in the whole world know about it. Well, now so, more. That, yeah, now a lot of people know. So now it's famous. <laughs> Great <Yeah>. question. <laughs> okay, let's get into our other school that hasn't asked a question yet. All right, our final classroom is joining us from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, some sixth grade science classes. Uh, Mrs. Buddiness classroom. Your microphone is on. There we go. Hi. Hi. Hey. Howdy, kid. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Miss Jill, why did you get into driving and why don't you live how do you get into diving and how did I what did you say, how did you get into diving um, how did I get into diving um, so when I was a kid I got my first experience on scuba at a swimming pool but I didn't actually get certified as a scuba diver until I was in university and I'd kind of earned enough money in order to take a class but my first experience was was when I was young and if you're at least 10 years old out there, then you can actually start scuba diving as a junior scuba diver and take a class to do that. And once I got started, I did not want to stop. So uh, it's been pretty constant since then. And you can start at 10 years old, but you can go past 70. It was Tom's 70th birthday just two days ago. So you can keep exploring from early to late. Yeah, they're, they're saying happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, happy birthday. Uh, awesome. uh, cool. I think Why don't one, go one with more of our sports. Yeah. Yeah. Maria. 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 Maria fun use and also how would you find these plants? How would you know what to look for when you're out there? So this one, remember it's white sage? Oh, yeah. All right, so everyone grab a leaf. So they're all gonna take a leaf. Can you see everybody? Yep, can you see yep, her? Yep, we can see it. All right, mm -hmm. so get your leaf. So one is if you have chicken pox, you can bathe in it. But what was another thing you could do after you ate? Let's all show them what to do. So you take it. I feel so clean and fresh, you guys. That's the right answer. Good. And then we're doing this. And so, and then, so if you're looking for something like this, and you're going, and we went out, we were all being plant hunters, and we were looking for leaves, and you would use this leaf and you would look for what it looks like and also you could see what is it one minute one minute so you see what it smells like and what it feels like on your teeth so that's just also a way to look for the kind of plants once you know to be a plant hunter yourself you guys all did an awesome job and i'm sure you all would too cool 
Thank you. Right. Yeah, All thanks. Right. Jill, our so class in Tennessee. I'm not sure if we had their question right because she's still waiting. So let's see if we had the question right. In Tennessee, did we get the question right? Okay. No. Okay. No. Oh, no. <laughs> um, why don't more women die? Uh. Why don't more women die? Oh, great question. Well, you, you know, when I was a kid, there weren't many women that died at all. And every year there's more and more and more. So there's really no reason why we can't. Uh, maybe some, you know, social and societal issues have, have kept us from being encouraged to dive. But there's no reason why we can't dive and do some of the most exciting exploration and science out there. Great question. Yeah, that's probably a good one to wrap up with, right, Joe? Unless there's more time on your end. Yeah, we've just, we've hit the hour mark. I do want to give a shout out. There's a class in Winnipeg on Twitter said they're watching. So a shout out to Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba. All right. Um, Winnipeg. <laughs> Stay warm. All right. We had lots of other classrooms watching along. I was watching the feed along the bottom, so I can pass you those details later. But what a great hangout, guys. So much information yeah. from the fossils to the, the animals in the caves to the, uh, the augmented reality. It looks like you guys are having an absolute blast out there. And I'm glad we got to meet some of the students who are uh, joining you on some of those field trip days. Awesome. And anyone that missed us today can catch us tomorrow at 11 o'clock on another Hangout. That's right. We're going live again from Abaco at 11 tomorrow Eastern. So um, let's see. I'm going to throw things to Megan for a moment from the Nat Geo side. And then we'll pop back in and we'll do a, a goodbye with the classrooms. Great. So I okay. just want to say from all of us at Nat Geo, thank you so much to Kenny and Jill, the whole team and the students in the Bahamas. It was so wonderful to get to, to, get to meet so many of you. Uh, and thank you also to our fabulous host, Joe Gabowski, and to all the classrooms watching from all over who shared really great questions. Our next Explorer Classroom is going to be this Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern with T.H. Colhane who's another explorer, who's an urban planner, who's working on improving people's access to clean water. And so to learn more about that and sign up, check out natgeoed.org. All right, Joe, let's let everyone say goodbye. All right, Megan, thanks so much. Good to the day. whole goodbye. team uh, in the Bahamas, thank you for uh, everything you did for us today. Uh, Jill and Kenny, give Christina a shout out. I've hosted Kenny or Christina in the past, Zanato, so give her a shout out from me. Yeah. All right. Um, and we will, in a minute, after you guys have a chance to say goodbye, we'll turn the mics on, let the classroom say goodbye, and thank you. Okay, thanks for joining us. We just want to hear as loud as we can from all the classes out there. All right, bye -bye. here we go. Bye. Bye. All right. Thanks everybody for that awesome time. Goodbye and thank you. We'll see you again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>